Hi, thank you for joining me today. We've been reading A Course in Miracles, uh, the manual, the, the text, and um, I just did a live stream of chapter five on Facebook, and um, I guess there was some kind of technical difficulty because at the end of all of it, Facebook had no video to share. So I'm going to reshoot this now. And um, uh, I get to read it twice. <laughs> so let's, let's have some fun with this. Okay, we are reading chapter five. Um, and chapter five is uh, healing and wholeness. And before I started, I read a little bit of an introduction here. Um, everything you learn about this work, A Course in Miracles, every change you make in your heart, any tiny bit that your heart opens up through this work and allows love to flow to yourself and then to others, it opens up the possibility that another person's heart may also open. So this is because we are all truly one and the way we will heal the world is by healing ourselves. So we heal ourselves by releasing ourselves from the fog from within which we have been living. And that fog came about through this sense of separation that we created and then uh, people in power have actually leveraged this fog uh, to their own advantage. So society is really at a disadvantage at this point, humanity in general. Um, and we see this every day in real life in the most extreme ways. So the time is past due that we step up and awaken from the dream so that we can get back to um, the task at hand, which is creating heaven on earth. That is why we're all here. It's why we came here into form. And uh, we're very far off task at the moment. Here's a great quote about the work of A Course in Miracles. It, uh, it does a great definition for the word miracle. A miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love, a return to love. Yet we are surrounded by mental mists. That is what a miracle is a parting of those mists, a change in perception, a return to love, a decision to see things differently. Love is what we were born with. It cannot be destroyed. It can only be covered over, clouded over. A miracle is a clearing of those clouds. So let's begin chapter five. And again, a reminder um, to try and not let the uh, try not to let the language get in the way. Uh, it's, it's not easy language to uh, listen to. It's definitely not easy language to read. And um, I just encourage you not to let that uh, keep you from accessing the great wisdom that is contained in these pages. So this is chapter five. The entire chapter is healing and wholeness. And there are eight sections. This is the introduction. To heal is to make happy. I have told you to think how many opportunities you have had to gladden yourself and how many you have refused. This is the same as telling you that you have refused to heal yourself. The light that belongs to you is the light of joy. Radiance is not associated with sorrow. Joy calls forth an integrated willingness to share it. It promotes the mind's natural impulse to respond as one. Those who attempt to heal without being wholly joyous themselves call forth different kinds of responses at the same time and thus deprive others of the joy of responding wholeheartedly. To be wholehearted, you must be happy. If fear and love cannot coexist, and if it is impossible to be wholly fearful and remain alive, the only possible state of that is, is that of love. There is no difference between love and joy. Therefore, the only possible whole state 
is the wholly joyous. To heal or be made joyous is therefore the same as to integrate and make one. That is why it makes no difference to what part or by what part of the sonship healing is offered. Every part benefits and benefits equally. You are being blessed by every beneficent thought of any of your brothers anywhere. You should want to bless them in return out of gratitude. You need not know them individually or they you. The light is so strong that it radiates throughout the sonship and returns thanks to the Father for radiating his joy upon it. Only God's holy children are worthy of channels of his joy because only they are beautiful enough to hold it by sharing it. It is impossible for a child of God to love his neighbor except as himself. That is why the healer's prayer is, let me know this brother as I know myself. Section two of A Course in Miracles, Healing and Wholeness, Chapter 5, and this is an invitation to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a thought by which two minds perceive their oneness and become glad. This gladness calls to every part of the sonship to rejoice with them and lets God go out into them, through them, and through them. Only the healed mind can experience revelation with lasting effect because revelation is an experience of pure joy. If you do not choose to be wholly joyous, your mind cannot have what it does not choose to be. Remember that spirit knows no difference between having and being. The higher mind thinks according to the laws spirit obeys and therefore honors only the laws of God. To spirit, getting is meaningless and giving is all. Having everything, spirit holds everything by giving it and thus creates as the Father created. While this kind of thinking is totally alien to having things, even to the lower mind, it is quite comprehensible in connection with ideas. If you share a physical possession, you do divide its ownership. If you share an idea, however, you do not lessen it. All of it is still yours, although all of it has been given away. Further, if one to whom you give it accepts it as his, he reinforces it in your mind and increases it. If you can accept the concept that the world is one of ideas, the whole belief in the false association the ego makes between giving and losing is gone. Let us start our process of reawakening with just a few simple concepts. Thoughts increase by being given away. The more who believe in them, the stronger they become. Everything is an idea. How then can giving and losing be associated. This is the invitation to the Holy Spirit. I have said already that I can reach up and bring the Holy Spirit down to you, but I can bring him to you only at your own invitation. The Holy Spirit is in your mind. No, the Holy Spirit is in your right mind, as he was in mine. The Bible says, may the mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus and uses this as a blessing. It is the blessing of miracle-mindedness. It asks you that you may think as I thought, joining me in Christ thinking. The Holy Spirit is the only part of the Holy Trinity that has a symbolic function. He is referred to as the healer, the comforter, and the guide. He is also described as something separate, apart from the Father and from the Son. 
I myself said, if I go, I will send you another comforter and he will abide with you. His symbolic function makes the Holy Spirit difficult to understand. However, symbolism is open to different interpretations. As a man and also of one of God's creations, my right thinking, which came from the Holy Spirit or the universal inspiration, taught me first and foremost that this inspiration is for all. I could not have it myself without knowing this. The word know is proper in this context because the Holy Spirit is so close to knowledge that he calls it forth or better, allows it to come. I have spoken before of the higher or true perception, which is so near to truth that God himself can flow across the little gap. Knowledge is always ready to flow everywhere, but it cannot oppose. Therefore, you can obstruct it, although you can never lose it. The Holy Spirit is the Christ mind, which is aware of the knowledge that lies beyond perception. He came into being with the separation as a protect, protection, inspiring the atonement principle at the same time. Before that, there was no need for healing, for no one was comfortless. The voice of the Holy Spirit is the call to atonement or the restoration of the integrity of the mind. When the atonement is complete and the whole sonship is healed, there will be no call to return, and what God creates is eternal. The Holy Spirit will remain with God's sons, no, with the sons of God, to bless their creations and keep them in the light of joy. God honored even the miscreations of his children because they made them, but he also blessed his children with a way of thinking that could raise their perceptions so they could so so high that they could almost reach back to him. The Holy Spirit is the mind of the atonement. He represents a state of mind close enough to one-mindedness that transfer to it is at last possible. Perception is not possible. No, perception is not knowledge. But it can be transferred to knowledge or cross over into it. It might even be more helpful here to use the literal meaning of transferred or carried over since the last step is taken by God. The Holy Spirit, the shared inspiration of all the sonship, induces a kind of perception in which many elements are like those in the kingdom of heaven itself. First, its universality is perfectly clear, and no one who attains it could believe for one instant that sharing it involves anything but gain. Second, it is incapable of attack, and therefore truly open. This means that although it does not engender knowledge, it does not obstruct it in any way. Finally, it points the way beyond healing that it brings and leads the mind beyond its own integration towards the path of creation. It is at this point that sufficient quantitative change occurs to produce a real qualitative shift. Let me just say for a second before I continue reading, what, the, what we're dealing with here is basically the, the main difference between most human beings and Jesus. And that is that he remembered where he came from. He was aware of his connection to divinity, to source. He understood he was an individuated divinity, uh, aspect of divinity. And he understood that God was within him. If we were to all wake up to this knowledge, we would be as, as Christ was. That was his intent in his sharing and in his teachings. It's the intent of this sharing here, this book. 
is to is to remind us that there was no difference between Jesus and any one of us with the exception of the fact that he remembered where he came from. He remembered what he was. He tried to show us how we could be the same. And instead of working to be the same, we put him on a pedestal. So I'm going to continue reading now. This is chapter th or section three of chapter five. Chapter five is healing and wholeness. And this is section three, the voice for God. Healing is not creating, it is reparation. The Holy Spirit promotes healing by looking beyond it to what the children of God were before healing was needed and will be again when they have been healed. This alteration of the time sequence should be quite familiar because it is very similar to the shift in the perception of time that the miracles introduces. The Holy Spirit is the motivation for miracle mindedness, the decision to heal the separation by letting it go. Your will is still in you because God placed it in your mind, and although you keep it asleep, you cannot obliterate it. God himself keeps your will alive by transmitting it from his mind to yours as long as there is time. The miracle itself is a reflection of this union of will between father and son. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. He is the call to return with which God blessed the minds of his separated sons. This is the vocation of the mind. The mind had, has no calling until the separation because before that it had only being and would not have understood the call to right thinking. The Holy Spirit is God's answer to the separation, the means by which the atonement heals until the whole mind returns to creating. The principle of atonement and the separation began at the same time. When the ego was made, God placed in the mind the call to joy. This call is so strong that the ego always dissolves at its sound. That is why you must choose to hear one of two voices within you. One you made yourself, and that one is not of God. But the other is given you by God, who asks you only to listen to it. The Holy Spirit is in you in a very literal sense. It is the voice that calls you back where you were before and will be again. It is possible even in this world to hear only that voice and no other. It takes effort and a great willingness to learn. It is the final lesson that I learned and God's son are as equal as learners as they are sons. So you see, this is where he's saying that he, he remembered. You are the kingdom of heaven, but you have let the belief in darkness enter your mind, and so you need a new light. The Holy Spirit is the radiance that you must let banish the idea of darkness. It is the glory before which dissociation falls away and the kingdom of heaven breaks through into its own. Before the separation, you did not need guidance. You knew as you will know again, but as you do not know now. God does not guide because he can share only perfect knowledge. Guidance is evaluative because it implies that there is a right way and also a wrong way, one to be chosen and the other to be avoided. By choosing one, you give up the other. The choice for Holy Spirit is the choice for God. God is not in you in a literal sense. You are a part of him. When you chose to leave him, he gave you a voice to speak for him because he could no longer share his knowledge with you without hindrance. Direct communication was broken because you made another voice.
I want to just pause here and say the other voice being the ego. The ego is a function of the housing. And um, I will be shooting some videos, some support videos that talk about the ego and our housing and how the body works. Um, so you might look for those for some supplemental support here. Um, the Holy Spirit calls you both to remember and to forget. You have chosen to be in a state of opposition in which opposites are possible. As a result, there are choices you must make. In the holy state, the will is free, and so that is creative power is unlimited, and choice is meaningless. Freedom to choose is the same power as freedom to create, but its application is different. Choosing depends on a split mind. The Holy Spirit is one way of choosing. God did not leave his children comfortless, even though they chose to leave him. The voice they put in their minds was not the voice for his will, for which the uh, Holy Spirit speaks. The, Holy, the voice of the Holy Spirit does not command because it is incapable of arrogance. It does not demand. It does not seek control. It does not overcome because it does not attack. It merely reminds. It is compelling only because of what it reminds you of. It brings you to your, it brings to your mind the other way, remaining quiet even in the midst of the turmoil you may make. The voice for God is always quiet because it speaks of peace. Peace is stronger than war because it heals. War is division, not increase. No one gains from strife. What profiteth a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you listen to the wrong voice, you have lost sight of your soul. You cannot lose it, but you cannot know it. It is therefore lost to you until you choose right. What he's saying here is you can't know yourself if your ego is running your life. Because you're listening to your ego. There's a whole other voice inside of us. The Holy Spirit is your guide in choosing. He is in the part of your mind that always speaks for the right choice because he speaks for God. He is your remaining communication with God, which you can interpret but cannot destroy. The Holy Spirit is the way in which God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Both heaven and earth are in you because the call of both is in your mind. The voice for God comes from your own altars to him. These altars are not things, they are devotions, yet you have other devotions now. Your divided devotion has given you the two voices, and you must choose at which altar you want to serve. The call you answer now is an evaluation because it is a decision. The decision is very simple. It is made on the basis of which call is worth more to you. My mind will always be like yours because we are created as equals. It was only my decision that gave me all power in heaven and earth. My only gift to you is to help you make the same decision. This decision is the choice to share it because this decision itself is this decision to share it. It is made by giving and is therefore the one choice that resembles true creation. I am your model for decision. By deciding for God, I showed you that this decision can be made and that you can make it. I have assured you that the mind that decided for me is also in you and that you can let it change just as it changed me. You can let it change you just as it changed me. This mind is unequivocal because it hears only one voice and answers only in one way. You are the light of the world with me. Rest does not come from sleeping, but from waking. The Holy Spirit 
is the call to awaken and be glad. The world is very tired because it is the idea of weariness. Our task is the joyous one of waking to the call for God. Everyone will answer the call of the Holy Spirit, or the sonship cannot be as one. What better vocation could there be for any a part of the kingdom than to restore it to the perfect integration that can make it whole? Hear only this through the Holy Spirit within you, and teach your brothers to listen as I am teaching you. When you are tempted by the wrong voice, call on me to remind you how to heal by sharing my decision and making it stronger. As we share this goal, we increase its power to attract the whole sonship and to bring it back into the oneness in which it was created. Remember that yoke means join together and burden means message. Let us restate my yoke is easy and my burden light as this. Let us join together for my message is light. I have enjoined you to behave as I have behaved, but we must respond to the same mind to do this. This mind must be the Holy Spirit, whose will is for God always. He teaches you how to keep me as the model for your thought and to behave like me as a result. The power of our joint motivation is beyond belief, but not beyond accomplishment. What we can accomplish together has no limits, because the call for God is the call to the unlimited. Child of God, my message is for you to hear and give away your answer, the Holy Spirit within you. And this is now chapter five, Healing and Wholeness, section four, The Guide to Salvation. The way to recognize your brother is by recognizing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in him. Let me just stop and say, This would apply to everybody. And I know in the world right now, there are lots and lots of people that we see on television that it's very hard to see the good in them. It's very hard to hold loving thoughts for them. But this is exactly what we are here to do. And this is exactly what this is talking about here. The way to recognize your brother is by recognizing the Holy Spirit in him. So when you look at anybody, if you do not see them as an individuated expression of divinity, if you don't hold them in your heart as the Holy Spirit, then you are not honoring them the way you should. And you are obviously not honoring yourself. I don't expect that you're going to get there today. It's, it's a very difficult lesson. But this is exactly what he's talking about here. And a, a reminder, I can't remember if I've said this already today. I've done a lot of reading. Um, this is Jesus speaking. This is channeled work. And this is Jesus' voice through the person he channeled this information through that we're reading here. So the guide to salvation, the way to recognize your brother is by recognizing the Holy Spirit in him. I have already said that the Holy Spirit is the bridge for the transfer of perception to knowledge. So we can use the terms as if they were related because in his mind they are. This relationship must be in his mind because unless it were, the separation between the two ways of thinking would not be open to healing. His is part of the Holy Trinity because his mind is partly yours and also partly God's. This needs clarification, not in statement, but in experience. The Holy Spirit is the idea of healing, being thought the idea gains as it is shared. Being the called for God 
it is also the idea of God. Since you are part of God, it is also the idea of yourself as well as all his creations. The idea of the Holy Spirit shares the property of other ideas because it follows the laws of the universe of which it is a part. It is strengthened by being given away. It increases in you as you give it to your brother. Your brother does not have to be aware of the Holy Spirit in himself or in you for this miracle to occur. He may have dissociated the call for God, just as you have. This dissociation is healed in both of you as you become aware of the call for God in him and thus acknowledge its being. There are two diametrically opposed ways of seeing your brother. They must both be in your mind because you are the perceiver. They must also be in his because you are perceiving him. See him through the Holy Spirit in his mind, and you will recognize him in yours. What you acknowledge in your brother, you are acknowledging in yourself, and what you share, you strengthen. The voice of the Holy Spirit is weak in you. That is why you must share it. It must be increased in strength before you can hear it. It is impossible to hear it in yourself, while it is also weak in your mind. It is not weak in itself, but it is limited by your unwillingness to hear it. If you make the mistake of looking for the Holy Spirit in yourself alone, your thoughts will frighten you, because by adopting the ego's viewpoint, you are undertaking an ego alien journey within the ego as guide, with the ego as guide. This is bound to produce fear. Delay is of the ego because time is, is its concept, the ego's concept. Both time and delay are meaningless in eternity. I have said before that the Holy Spirit is God's answer to the ego. Everything of which the Holy Spirit reminds you is in direct opposition to the ego's notions because true and false perceptions are themselves opposed. The Holy Spirit has the task of undoing what the ego has made. He does it at the same level on which the ego operates, or the mind would be unable to understand the change. I have repeatedly emphasized that one level of mind is not understandable to the other. So it is with the ego and the Holy Spirit, with time and with eternity. Eternity is an idea of God, so the Holy Spirit understands it perfectly. Time is a belief of the ego. So the lower mind, which is the ego's domain, accepts it without question. The only aspect of time is that eternal is now. So let me pause for a second and just speak a little about time. Time doesn't exist. Everything's happening at once. The concept of past lives, future lives, uh, is, uh, is one to enable us to uh, go to those lifetimes and experience them, but ultimately they are all happening at the same time. There is only now. Uh, time is a construct. It's a mental construct. And again, uh, you, you can get bogged down on this. The way to think of it is what you look out at is a hologram. Uh, and and I'll ha I have uh, other videos that will be shot that will help explain all of this. But basically think of it this way. You are the only thing that ultimately exists. Everything else that you perceive is a co-creation. So it, 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 I, I like to call it a hologram. It's really not real. Again, because the chair I'm sitting on is made out of the same stuff the computer's made out of, is made the same stuff as, 
as God is made out of, and it's all moving. So here I think I'm sitting on a chair, but if I'm sitting on something that's moving, then which is it? Well, it's both. And so when you realize that it's both, you really do have to come to the conclusion that what we see when we look out with our eyes is not what's real. So that that's just, I hope that helps a little with this, with this material, because it's not easy material. The Holy Spirit is the mediator between the interpretations of the ego and the knowledge of the spirit. Its ability to deal with symbols enables it to work with the ego's beliefs in its own language. The Holy Spirit's ability to look beyond symbols into eternity is, it what, it, is what enables it to understand the laws of God for which it speaks. It can therefore perform the function of reinterpreting what the ego makes, not by destruction, but by understanding. Understanding is light, but you yourself do not know this. It is therefore the task of the Holy Spirit to reinterpret you on behalf of God. You cannot understand yourself alone. This is because you have no meaning apart from your rightful place in the sonship, and the rightful place of the sonship is God. This is your life, your eternity, and yourself. It is of this that the Holy Spirit reminds you. It is this that the Holy Spirit sees. This vision frightens the ego because it is so calm. Peace is the ego's greatest enemy because according to its interpretation of arrival, war is the guarantee of survival. The ego becomes strong in strife. If you believe there is strife, you will react viciously because the idea of danger has entered your mind. The idea itself is an appeal to the ego. The Holy Spirit, as vigilant as the ego to the call of danger, opposing it with its strength, just as the ego welcomes it. The Holy Spirit counters this welcome by welcoming peace. Eternity and peace are as closely related as our time and war. So this is, this is the challenge. We're in this housing. And the housing has a function that I call the ego that is here to protect it and uh, make sure that it survives because the body doesn't realize that it's divinity. The body doesn't realize that death is not something to be feared because for the body, it's fearful. To the body, death is the end. But that's the only thing it's the end of, is of the functioning housing. It's just a death of the housing. It's not a death of the spirit. So this is really, this is really so important to understand. And, and, and so uh, that's the Holy Spirit counters this welcome by welcoming peace. Eternity and peace are as closely related as time and war. And time and war are a function of the ego and eternity and peace are a function of the Holy Spirit and divinity. Reading onward. Perception derives meaning from relationships. Those you accept are the foundations of your beliefs. Separation is merely another term for a split mind. The ego is the symbol of separation, just as the Holy Spirit is the symbol of peace. What you perceive in others you are strengthening in yourself. You're, you may let your mind misperceive, but the Holy Spirit lets your mind reinterpret its own misperceptions. So the point to remember there is what, it, what it's saying. It's both positive and negative. But what you perceive in others, you are strengthening in yourself. If you are perceiving hate in others, you are strengthening hate in yourself. This is why it is so important to come to this place where you can look 
at the other people in the world and realize that they are also divinity, that they are God in expression. Doesn't mean you like what they do. Doesn't mean you accept what they do. Doesn't mean that what they are doing is in any way appropriate or godlike or enlightened. But you can hold them in your heart with love regardless because they are a part of you. And if you are hating them, then you are hating a part of you. If you are judging them, you are judging a part of you. Not easy to understand in practice, but it's important that we work our way through this. And it's really important we all come to be able to uh, use this information in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher. It uses only what your mind already understands to teach you what you don't, that you do not understand it. The Holy Spirit can deal with a very reluctant learner without going counter to its mind because part of it is still for God. Despite the ego's attempts to conceal this part, it is still much stronger than the ego, although the ego does not recognize it. The Holy Spirit recognizes it perfectly because it is its own dwelling place, the place in the mind where he is at home. You are at home there too, because it is the place of peace and peace is of God. You who are a part of God are not at home except in his peace. If peace is eternal, you are at home only in eternity. The ego made the world as it perceives it, but the Holy Spirit, the reinterpreter of of what, made the, of what the ego made sees the world as a teaching device for bringing you home. The Holy Spirit must perceive time and reinterpret it into timelessness. It must work through opposites because it must work with and for a mind that is in opposition. Correct and learn and be open to learning. You have not made truth but truth can still set you free. Look as the Holy Spirit looks and understand as he understands. This understanding looks back to God in remembrance of me. He is in communion with God always, and he is a part of you. He is your guide to salvation because he holds the resemblance of things past and to come and brings them to the present. He holds this gladness gently in his mind, asking only that you increase it in his name by sharing it to increase his joy in you. Uh, if you get bogged down with the, with the uh, uh, pronouns here, uh, I, I, when I can, I switch it to it. Uh, but... Uh, again, this is what I mean when I say don't let the language bog you down. Uh, we could change it to her. We can change it to it. It is genderless. Uh, it is genderless. But uh, as uh, when this was uh, shared uh, in the 1970s, uh, this information came through. We were still very uh, uh, gender specific with our pronouns. So... Uh, again, just I suggest don't let it bog you down. Uh, I do try to uh, substitute it out occasionally, the, all the hymns. But um, w you know, there are some people that do these readings and they switch it out for her. Or, um, and I, I just let's just not get too bogged down in it. Now we are on section five within chapter five. So chapter five is healing and wholeness. And this is teaching and healing within that chapter. What fear has hidden still is a part of you. Joining the atonement is the way out of fear. The Holy Spirit will help you reinterpret everything that you perceive as fearful and teach you that only what is loving is true. Truth is beyond your ability to destroy, but is entirely within your ability to accept. It belongs to you because as an extension of God, you created it with him. It is yours because it is a part of you, just as you are a part of God because he created you. 
Nothing that is good can be lost because it comes from the Holy Spirit, the voice for creation. Nothing that is not good was ever created and therefore cannot be protected. The atonement is the guarantee of the safety of the kingdom and the union of the sonship is its protection. Ego cannot prevail against the kingdom because the sonship is united. In the presence of those who hear the Holy Spirit's call to be as one, the ego fades away and is undone. The sonship is, is humanity. It could be daughtership, it could be itship. It's, it's, uh, that's another you know, um, masculine word when in fact it is all of humanity. What the ego makes, it keeps to itself, and so it is without strength. Its existence is unshared. It does not die, it merely was never born. Physical birth is not a beginning, it is a continuing. Everything that continues has already been born. It will increase as you are willing to return with the unhealed part of your mind to the higher part returning it undivided to creation. I have come to give you the foundation so your own thoughts can make you really free. You have carried the burden of unshared ideas that are too weak to increase, but having made them, you did not realize how to undo them. You cannot cancel out your past errors alone. They will not disappear from your mind without the atonement a remedy not of your making. The atonement must be understood as a pure act of sharing. This is what I meant when I said it is even possible, even in this world, to listen to one voice. If you are a part of God and the sonship is one, you cannot be limited to the self that the ego sees. Every loving thought held in any part of the sonship belongs to every part. It is shared because it is loving. Sharing is God's way of creating and also yours. The ego can keep you in exile from the kingdom, but in the kingdom itself, it has no power. The ideas of the spirit do not leave the mind that thinks them, nor can they conflict with each other. However ideas of the ego can conflict, However, ideas of the ego can conflict because they occur at different levels and also include opposite thoughts at the same time. It is impossible to share opposing thoughts. You can share only the thoughts that are of God and that he keeps for you. And as such, and as of such is the kingdom of heaven. The rest remains with you until the Holy Spirit has reinterpreted them in the light of the kingdom, making them too worthy of being shared. When they have been sufficiently purified, he lets, excuse me, he lets you give them away. To decision, the decision to share them is their purification. So um, in thinking about the troublesome people we see in the news and reading this paragraph. You can share only the thoughts that are of God and that he keeps for you and, and of such is the kingdom of heaven. The rest remains with you until the Holy Spirit has reinterpreted them in the light of the kingdom making them too worthy of being shared. So you are not divinity in expression when you are, divini when you are expressing hateful or judgmental or other uh, unloving thoughts. You're really just hurting yourself the rest remains with you and they will remain with you until you in connection with your divinity 
become one. And then they're gone because now you've become an integrated aspect of divinity and your ego is no longer running you. I heard one voice because I understood that I could not atone for myself alone. Listening to one voice implies the decision to share it in order to hear it yourself. The mind that was in me is still irresistibly drawn to every other mind created by God because God's wholeness is the wholeness of, is, is the wholeness of his son. You cannot be hurt and do not want to show your brother anything except your wholeness. Show him that he cannot hurt you and hold nothing against him or you hold it against yourself. This is the meaning of turning the other cheek. Teaching is done in many ways, above all by example. Teaching should be healing because it is the sharing of ideas and the recognition that to share ideas is to strengthen them. I cannot forget my need to teach what I have learned, which arose in me because I learned it. I call upon you to teach what you have learned because by, do by doing so, you can depend on it. Make it dependable in my name because my name is the name of God's son. What I learned, I give you freely, and the mind that was in me rejoices as you choose to hear it. The Holy Spirit atones in all of us by undoing and thus lifts the burden you have placed in your mind. By following him, you are led back to God where you belong. And how can you find the way except by taking your brother with you? My part in the atonement is not complete until you join it and forsake you. Because to forsake you, you would, you would be to forsake myself and God who created me. I'm going to read that again. My part in the atonement is not complete until you join it and give it away. As you learn, so shall, as you teach, so shall you learn. I will never leave you nor forsake you, because to forsake you would be to, would be to forsake myself and God who created me. You forsake yourself and God if you forsake any of your brothers. You must learn to see them as they are and understand they are God, they belong to God as you do. How could you treat your brother better than by rendering unto God the things that are God? This is going to be challenging for people. Absolutely. There's some very challenging personalities out there in the world that uh, you're going to resist this lesson when you think of them. And um, I can just, I just encourage you, keep Keep going over this lesson until you can look at them with love and realize that what you think you're seeing is something else. What you think they're doing, in spite of what it looks like in 3D reality here, is something else. It's something else entirely. The atonement gives you the power of a healed mind but the power to create is of God. Therefore, those who have been forgiven must devote themselves first to healing because having received the idea of healing, they must give it to hold it. The full power of creation cannot be expressed as long as any of God's ideas is withheld from the kingdom. The joint will of the sonship is that only the creator that can create like the Father, because only the complete can think completely, and the thinking of God lacks nothing. I'll read it again. The joint will of the sonship is the only creator that can create like the Father, because only the complete mind can think completely, and the thinking of God lacks nothing. 
everything you think that is not through the Holy Spirit is lacking. Which basically would mean every, lo every unloving thought, any unloving thought that you hold. Because it would not be through the Holy Spirit and it would be lacking. How can you who are so holy suffer? All your past except its beauty is gone and nothing is left but a blessing. I have saved all your kindness and every loving thought you ever had. I have purified them of the errors that hid their light and kept them for you in their own perfect radiance. They are beyond destruction and beyond guilt. They come from the Holy Spirit within you, and we know that God, what God creates is eternal. You can indeed depart in peace, because I have loved you as I have loved myself. You can go with my blessing and for my blessing, hold it and share it, that it may always be ours. I place the peace of God in your heart and in your hands to hold and to share. The heart is pure to hold it, and the hands are strong to give it. We cannot lose. My judgment is as strong as the wisdom of God, in whose heart and hands we have our being. His quiet children are his blessed sons. The thoughts of God are with you. And here we are, chapter five, healing and wholeness, section six, the ego's use of guilt. Some of our concepts will become clearer and more personally meaningful if the ego's use of guilt is clarified. The ego has a purpose, just as the Holy Spirit has. The ego's purpose is fear, because only the fearful can be egoic. The ego's logic is as impeccable as that of the Holy Spirit because your mind has the means at its disposal to side with heaven or earth as it elects. But again, remember that both are in you. In heaven, there is no guilt because the kingdom is attained through the atonement, which will leases you to create. In heaven there is no guilt because the kingdom is attained through the atonement which releases you to create. The word create is appropriate here because once what you have made is undone by the Holy Spirit, the blessed residue is restored and therefore continues in creation. What is truly blessed is incapable of giving rise to guilt and must give rise to joy. This makes it invulnerable to the ego because its peace is unsaleable. It is invulnerable to disruption because it is whole. Guilt is always disruptive. Anything that, en that engenders fear is divisive because it obeys the laws of division. If the ego is the symbol of separation, it is also the symbol of guilt. Guilt is more than merely not of God. It is the symbol of attack on God. Guilt is a totally meaningless concept except to the ego. But do not underestimate the power of the ego's belief in it. This is the belief from which all guilt really stems. The ego is the part of the mind that believes in division. How could part of God detach itself without believing in its attacking him? We spoke before of the authority problem as based on the concept of usurping God's power. The ego believes that this is what you did because it believes that it is you. If you identify with the ego, you must perceive yourself as guilty. Whenever you respond to your ego, you will experience guilt 
and you will fear punishment. Ego is quite literally a fearful thought. However ridiculous the idea of attacking God may be to the sane mind, never forget that the ego is not sane. It represents a delusional system and speaks for it. Listening to the ego's voice means that you believe it is possible to attack God and that part of him has been torn away from you. Fear of retaliation from without follows because the severity of the guilt is so acute that it must be projected. Whatever you accept into your mind has reality for you. It is your acceptance of it that makes it real. If you enthrone the ego to your mind, you are allowing it to enter. You are allowing it to enter. You're allowing it to enter makes it your reality. This is because the mind is capable of creating reality or making illusions. I said, therefore, you must learn to think with God. To think with him is to think like him. This engenders joy, not guilt, because it is natural. Guilt is a sure sign that your thinking is unnatural. Unnatural thinking will always be attended with guilt because it is the belief in sin. The ego does not perceive sin as a lack of love, but as a possible act of assault, a positive act of assault. This is necessary to the ego's, ego's survival because as soon as you regard sin as lack, you will automatically attempt to remedy the situation and you will succeed. The ego regards this as doom, but you must learn to regard it as freedom. The guiltless mind cannot suffer. Being sane, the mind heals the body because it has been healed. The sane mind cannot conceive of illness because it cannot conceive of attacking anyone or anything. I said before that illness is a form of magic. It might be better to say that it is a form of magical solution. The ego believes that by punishing itself, it will mitigate the punishment of God. Yet, even in this, it is arrogant. It attributes to God a punishing intent and then takes this intent as its own prerogative. It tries to usurp all the functions of God as it perceives them because it recognizes that only total allegiance can be trusted. The ego cannot oppose the laws of God any more than you can, but it can interpret them according to what it wants, just as you can. That is why the question, what do you want, must be answered. You are answering it every minute and every second and every moment of decision is a judgment that is anything but ineffectual. It affects, its effects will follow automatically on the until the decision is changed. Remember though, that the alternatives themselves are unalterable. The Holy Spirit, like the ego, is a decision. Together they constitute all the alternatives the mind can accept and obey. The Holy Spirit and the ego are the only choices open to you. God created one, and so you cannot eradicate it. You made the other, and so you can. Only what God creates is irreversible and unchangeable. What you made can always be changed, because when you do not think like God, you are not really thinking at all. Delusional ideas are not real thoughts, although you can believe in them, but you are wrong. The function of thought comes from God and is in God. As part of his thought, you cannot think apart from him. So let me just uh, clarify here. So again, we're talking the two, the two basic uh, thought processes, one being God thought, holy thought, divine thought, the other being thoughts that are being generated by the body, which by the body meaning by the ego. So uh, 
and chances are most people are uh, choosing most thoughts uh, are egoic thoughts at this point. We're really to shift what's happening on the planet. We all need to wake up to this knowledge and understand that we're letting our egos run us uh, and our egos are basically uh, steeped in fear. Okay, reading onward. Irrational thought is disordered thought. God himself orders your thought because your thought was created by him. Guilt feelings are always a sign that you do not know this. They also show that you believe you can think apart from God and want to. Every disordered thought is attended by guilt at its inception and maintained by guilt in its continuance. Guilt is inescapable by those who believe they order their own thoughts and must therefore obey their dictates. This makes them feel responsible for their errors without recognizing that by accepting this responsibility, they are reacting irresponsibly. If the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself, and I assure you that it is, then the responsibility for what is atoned for cannot be yours. The dilemma is not, the dilemma cannot be resolved by accepting the solution of undoing. You would be responsible for the effects of all your wrong thinking if it could not be undone. The purpose of the atonement is to save the past in purified form only. If you accept the remedy for disordered thought, a remedy whose efficacy is beyond doubt, how can its symptoms remain? Continuing decision. The continuing decision to remain separated is the only possible reason for continuing guilt feelings. We have said this before, but did not emphasize the destructive results of the decision. Any decision of the mind will affect both behavior and experience. What you want, you expect. This is not delusional. Your mind does make your future, and it will turn back to full creation at any minute if it accepts the atonement first. It will also return to full creation the minute, the instant it has done so. Having given up its disordered thought, proper ordered thought, proper ordering of thought becomes quite apparent. Again, the shifting between the ego thoughts and um, the, uh, the mind of God, the thoughts that are coming to you through your Holy Spirit. Okay, chapter five, Healing and Wholeness, section seven, Time and Eternity. God in his knowledge is not waiting, but his kingdom is bereft while you wait. All the sons of God are waiting for your return, just as you are, are waiting for theirs. Delay does not matter in eternity, but it is tragic in time. You have elected to be in time rather than in eternity, and therefore you believe you are in time. Yet your election is both free and alterable. You do not belong in time, your place is only in eternity, where God himself placed you forever. Guilt feelings are preservers of time. They induce fears of retaliation or of abandonment, and thus ensure that the future will be like the past. This is the ego's continuity. It gives the ego a false sense of security by believing that you cannot escape from it but you can and you must. God suffers you the continuity of eternity in exchange. When you choose to make this exchange, you will simultaneously exchange guilt for joy, viciousness for love, pain for peace. My role is only to unchain your will and set it free. 
Your ego cannot accept this freedom and will oppose it at every possible moment and in every possible way. And so as its marker, you recognize what it can do because you gave it the power to do it. Remember the kingdom always, and remember that you who are a part of the kingdom cannot be lost. Mind that was in me is in you. The mind that was in me is in you, for God creates with perfect fairness. Let the Holy Spirit remind you always of his fairness, and let me teach you how to share it with your brothers. How else can the chance to claim it for yourself be given you? The two voices speak for different interpretations of the same thing simultaneously, or almost simultaneously, for the ego always speaks first. Alternate interpretations were unnecessarily were unnecessary until the first one was made. The ego speaks in judgment, and the Holy Spirit reverses its decision much as a higher court has the power to reverse a lower court's decisions in, its, in this world. The ego's decisions are always wrong because they are based on an error that they were made to uphold. Nothing the ego perceives is interpreted correctly. Not only does the ego cite scripture for its purpose, but it even interprets scripture as a witness for itself. The Bible is a fearful thing in the ego's judgment, Perceiving it as frightening, it interprets it fearfully. Being afraid, you do not appeal to the higher court because you believe its judgment would also be against you. There are many examples of how the ego's interpretations are misleading. But a few will suffice to show how the Holy Spirit can reinterpret them in his own light. So here's the first one. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Very common phrase we've heard from the Bible. He the Holy Spirit will interpret this to mean what you consider worth cultivating, you will cultivate in yourself. Your judgment of what is worthy makes it worthy for you. Here's another one. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is easily misinterpreted if you remember that ideas increase only by being shared. The intent of this statement emphasizes that vengeance cannot be shared. Give it, therefore, to the Holy Spirit, who will undo it in you, because it does not belong in your mind, which is a part of God. Here's another example. I will visit the sins of the father unto the third and fourth generation. As interpreted by the ego, this is particularly vicious. It becomes merely an attempt to guarantee the ego's own survival. To the Holy Spirit, the statement means that in later generations, he can still reinterpret what former generations had misunderstood and thus release the thoughts from the ability to produce fear. The wicked shall perish becomes a statement of atonement if the word perish is understood to be undone. Every loveless thought must be undone, a word the ego cannot even understand. To the ego, to be undone means to be destroyed. The ego will not be destroyed because it is a part of your thought and because it is uncreative and therefore unsharing, it will be reinterpreted to release you from fear. The part of your mind that you have given to the ego will merely return to the kingdom where your whole mind belongs. You can delay the completion of the kingdom, but you cannot introduce the concept of fear into it. You need not fear the higher court will condemn you. It will merely dismiss the case against you. There can be no case against a child of God, and every witness to guilt in God's creations is bearing false witness to God itself, himself. 
appeal everything you believe gladly to God's higher court because it speaks for him and therefore speaks truly. It will dismiss the case against you, however carefully you have built it up. The case may be foolproof, but it is not God-proof. The Holy Spirit will not hear it, because the Holy Spirit can only witness truly. The Holy Spirit's verdict will always be, Thine is the kingdom, because it is given to you to remind you of what you are. When I said I am come as a light into the world, I meant that I came to share the light with you. Remember my reference to the ego's dark glass and remember also that I said, do not look there. It is still true that where you look to find yourself is up to you. Your patience with your brother is your patience with yourself. Is not a child of God worth patience? I have shown you infinite patience because my will is that of our Father, from whom I learned of infinite patience. His voice was in me as it is in you, speaking for patience towards the sonship in the name of its creator. Now you must learn that only infinite patience produces immediate effects. This is the way in which time is exchanged for eternity. Infinite patience causes, calls upon infinite love. And by producing results now, it renders time unnecessary. We have repeatedly said that time is a learning device to be abolished when it is no longer useful. The Holy Spirit, who speaks for God in time, also knows that time is meaningless. He reminds you that of this, and he reminds you of this in every passing moment of time because it is in his special function to return you to eternity and remain to bless your creations there. He is the only blessing you can truly give because he is truly blessed. Because he has been given you freely by God, you must give him as you received him. The last section, Helian Holder, Section 8, The Decision for God. Do you really believe you can make a voice that can drown out gods? Do you really believe you can devise a thought system that can separate you from him? Do you really believe that you can plan for your safety and joy better than he can. You need neither be careful nor careless. You need merely cast your cares upon him because he careth for you. You are his care because he loves you. His voice reminds you always that all hope is yours because of his care. You cannot choose to escape his care because that is not his will, but you can choose to accept it, accept his care and use the infinite power of his care for all those he created by it. There have been many healers who did not heal themselves. They have not moved mountains by their faith because their faith was not whole. Some of, heal some of them have healed the sick at times, but they have not raised the dead unless the healer himself, unless the healer heals himself, he cannot believe that there is no order of difficulty in miracles. He has not learned that every God, every mind God created is equally worthy of being healed because God created it as whole. You are merely asked to return to God the mind as he created it. He asks you only for what he gave, knowing that this giving will heal you. 
Sanity is wholeness, and the sanity of your brothers is yours. So um, I'll just stop and share for a moment here, because he's talking about healing. We all have the ability, the abilities that Jesus had, that we've read about, that we've heard stories about, raising the dead, healing the sick, feeding the poor, all of the things that he did, walking on water, all those things. Absolutely, every single one of us can do what he did. But not until we uh, experience atonement and be, we become one with our maker, with ourselves, with our creation, with our divinity. I had an experience, uh, it's been a number of years now, I'm not going to try and figure out how many years off, off the cuff, but I will share with you that after uh, an experience that I had with Jesus, a personal experience that I had with Jesus, um, I stopped wearing my glasses. Very similar to Rhonda Burns in The Secret, um, I took them off, and I basically never put them on again. And I'm reading to you without glasses and without having had any correction done to my glasses. And what I'll tell you is that happened in my 50s. Yes, I believe it was my 50s. I was in my late 50s. I'd been wearing glasses since I was in college. I was wearing trifocals at the time. So uh, there have been many healers who did not heal themselves. They have not moved mountains by their faith because their faith was not whole. I was able to, at least for a moment in time, experience a wholeness in my faith that enabled me to heal my eyes. So I just thought I'd take a moment to share that to you with you. Uh, reading on, why should you listen to the endless insane calls you think are made upon you when you know the voice of God is in you? God commended his spirit to you and asks that you commend yours to him. He wills to keep it in perfect peace because you are of one mind and spirit with him. Excluding yourself from the atonement is the ego's last ditch defense of its own existence. It reflects the ego's need to be separate and your willingness to side with its separateness. This willingness means that you do not want to be healed. But the time is now. You have not been asked to work out the plan of salvation yourself because as I told you before, the remedy could not be of your making. God himself gave you the perfect correction for everything you made that is not in accord with his holy will. I am making his plan perfectly explicit to you and will also tell you of your part in it and how urgent it is to fulfill it. God weeps at the sacrifice of his children and who believe they are lost to him. I, 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 I personally doubt that God weeps, I, but I, what, what you need to realize is that uh, Divinity is looking out at humanity, the mass of humanity that is disconnected from source, that has chosen through forgetting to stay disconnected. Uh, because it's, it really is like we're in a play and the play is to create heaven on earth. And, and, uh, what we can imagine at the moment is that the majority of the actors in the play have put down their scripts and wandered off stage. And so there's just a few of us here that are running around, uh, still got our scripts in our hands, still remember uh, what's, what, how it's supposed to work. And, um, and the way we're going to help you wake up is we're going to heal ourselves. That's, uh, that's how it's going to work. So um, 
Whenever you are not wholly joyous, it is because you have reacted with a lack of love to one of God's creations. Perceiving this as a sin, you become defensive because you expect attack. The decision to react in this way is yours, and that can therefore be undone. It cannot be undone by repentance in the usual sense, because this implies guilt. If you allow yourself to feel guilty, you will reinforce the error rather than to allow it to be undone for you. Decision cannot be difficult. This is obvious. If you realize that you must already have decided not to be wholly joyous, if that is how you feel. Let me read that again. Decision cannot be difficult. This is obvious. If you realize that you must already have decided not to be wholly joyous, if, okay, <laughs> uh, I, it, the, there's just like a missing comma here. Decision cannot be difficult. This is obvious. If you realize that you must already have decided not to be wholly joyous, if that is how you feel. So if you're not feeling wholly joyous, you've made the decision. You are in that decision. Therefore, the first step in undoing it is to recognize that you actively decided wrongly, but can actively decide otherwise. Be very firm with yourself in this and keep yourself fully aware that the undoing process, which does not come from you, is nevertheless within you because God placed it there. Your part is merely to return your thinking to the point of which the error was made and give it over to the atonement in peace. That's how quickly we could all heal, folks. It's that quick. Say this to yourself as sincerely as you can, remembering that the Holy Spirit will respond fully to your slightest invitation. I must have decided wrongly because I am not at peace. I made the decision myself, but I can decide otherwise. I want to decide otherwise because I want to be at peace. I do not feel guilty because the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my wrong decision if I let him. I choose to let him by allowing him to decide for God for me. So that is the end of chapter five. Very powerful, very, very powerful. Uh, thank you for joining me. And if you have questions, as always, you can text them to 907-351-3003. I will do my best to respond. The daily lessons are available for you on um, Facebook in the Love by Light group also on YouTube and on SoundCloud. And uh, uh, one last note, I will not be reading for the next few weeks. So um, I will resume reading the chapters. The daily lessons will continue through, throughout the entire time. Thank you again for joining me. Namaste.